for the reaction from the rural primary schools or even the knowledge. But I have yet to find one specifically on the issues faced by the teachers. So my research, my research question here are, what are the teaching challenges? So what are the factors contributing to the teaching challenges? And what are the perceptions of the Malaysian's English language primary school teachers using the CEFA aligned syllabus? And my objective here is to identify the teaching challenges, to determine the factors that influence the teaching challenges, and to investigate the perceptions of the Malaysian English language primary school teachers using the CEFA aligned syllabus. Now, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to bring your attention to a quick background history of Malaysia's education system. Over the years, there were many plans, reforms to upgrade the standard of English in Malaysia. Now, the most recent ones are the 2013 Malaysia Education Blueprint or MEB 2013 to 2025. MEB aims to ensure students achieve a significant level of English. And in 2015, the English language education reform in Malaysia was launched. Now the roadmap is a 10 year reform plan to elevate our students English language proficiency in hopes to enable them into effective and proficient users. Now we are talking about Malaysia so far. How about the other parts of the world that have already adopted uh, CEFA? Let's take a look at China. China's adoption of CEFA changed to their own standard of CSE, the Chinese Standards of English. The plan was not successful because they were not unified in, the thing, in their planning. Different governmental departments took charge of education at different stages. Even in Japan, uh, where mandatory trainings for teachers was conducted, but the teachers were not cooperative because they did not understand their level of English was low, so they did not understand the training. Same with Thai, uh, Vietnam and also Thailand. However, Turkey, the country, one of the countries uh, first uh, adopted CEFR in Europe, the teachers were interested. However, the government gave little or no training about the CEFR, so the teachers were unable to effectively use CEFR in their classroom. Not to say that the uh, CEFA uh, is unsuccessful. There is one country that has proven the use of CEFA to be successful. Uzbekistan. They adopted CEFA in 2013. They noted an increase by 45% of the teacher's professional competence and quality of teaching and learning. Now, how did they do it? The teachers attend training programs. And when they passed the CEFA Align Proficiency Test, the government gave them monthly allowance. Ha, that is the incentive. I think Malaysian teachers would also love it. So how did I go about my uh, research? I conducted quantitative uh, method uh, based on three rudiments, uh, the study, the focus of study, and the instrument using questionnaire. I used quantitative method because I needed to make generalized generalizations from a large population that could articulate the facts and reveal patterns in research and of course using quantitative method my data would be more objective and less biased you may ask why quantitative method and not mixed method i needed multiple variables to be investigated at one instance uh, my participants were stratified and also um, it had the ability to quantify behaviors, opinions, attitudes, etc. within a short amount of time. Having the survey conducted online, it is cost effective with ubiquitous reach. And since anonymity was assured, uh, my respondents could freely answer and honestly answer my questions. Uh, on top of that, teachers also requested no interview due to the constraint of time. They were at that point of time uh, starting school and they had to do online teaching as well as face to face teaching. So what is my progress here? Process here, sorry, my process is first and foremost, first and foremost the ethical consideration. 
permission was granted from uh, relevant government departments and CERAC. And also pilot testing was done to make sure of, uh, to ensure validation and reliability of my questions. Uh, data was collected through online questionnaire and I use SPSS using the descriptive statistical analysis. The setting is Malaysian government funded primary schools and the teachers uh, were primary school teachers teaching English, regardless of whether they were English option or non-English option. Looking at my instruments here, I used questionnaire in Google Forms. There were five sections. From section A to section D, uh, they were closed in the questions with like a skills and section E open in the questions because since I couldn't uh, have an interview with the teachers, I wanted some personal feedbacks from them. So I open up my section E. OK, and the time to answer the question was between 15 to 20 minutes. Um, the time I posted up my questionnaire online uh, was about two weeks for them to answer the uh, questions. So coming to my findings, what did I find? I, the first thing I found was the teacher's proficiency level we had about 70% of English option teachers and about 30% non-English options. Now the 70% uh, percentile here, it could be because they attended PITO, P -I -T -O, the add-on option intervention plan um, by the government to overcome a shortage of English language teachers in the school. Let's take a look at this table. In the year 2014, OK, in the year 2014, that's the year when Cambridge Baseline did a survey and found that 25% of the teachers uh, achieve, uh, attain the C1 and the C2 level of proficiency, English proficiency. But as you can see from my survey, uh, my study here showed that we had 61.8%. A 61.8% of qualified teachers to teach English. Maybe uh, this is due to um, the program uh, APTIS and PRO-ELT conducted by the government to upgrade the teachers. So we have positive responses here. As you can see, overall the teachers were very happy about the SEFER curricula because they could see students' improvement using this curricula. Furthermore, they are very happy using the SEFER because the grades that they give the students uh, locally here, which could also mean that their students um, are equally of that standard in any other countries that use SEFER, meaning that a B2 student here is similar to a B2 student in another school, in another state, or even in, an, in another country. Um, the final one here, the world knowledge, is because you by using the uh, imported textbooks, right, the students gain world knowledge implicitly. Here is a table of the top five positive responses. If you have positive responses, definitely you will also have negative responses. Okay, the teachers preferred local contents in the textbooks instead of the foreign uh, cultures and foreign festivals that they, uh, the students find uh, rather new or foreign to them. Uh, also, they complained that they had insufficient time to complete the level two syllabus. Level two meaning uh, the year four to uh, year six. Rural school teachers complained that the uh, activities in the textbooks were rather challenging because the students in the rural school had little contact uh, with English language. Uh, the final one is rather sensitive here because uh, the teacher said that they were instructed to give justifications if they wish to give TP1 or TP2 grades to the students. OK, and um, these are the top five negative responses by the teachers. So in case um, those present here do not understand what is actually TP3, this is TP3 um, tables for the teachers to use. TP uh, is Paha Penguasaan. So it's also performance level. So if you look at the highlighted, 
highlighted a TP3 here, the pupils achieve expectations of the curriculum target. If they were to give one or two, means that the students are only on track to achieve the curriculum target or hardly achieve. OK, so let's go on to the next finding, which is actually also another concerning matter here. Uh, when I ask about the uh, use of local languages, you can see from the graph that uh, almost 50% of the teachers occasionally use local languages to teach English and 13% uh, frequently use local language, which I feel it's um, the teachers did not give uh, opportunity to the students to actually uh, be in contact uh, with the English language. So this one, the teacher should by now this year have already attended all six um, curriculum induction course or IC. Now, if you look at the five to six PPD courses or in-house courses attended by the teachers, only about a quarter of them have attended. So the other 75% have uh, not really done so. If you see the word missing here on the table, there are about 12 of them who are missing. They are not actually missing. They are the ones who have not taken the course. Given the reason that this was their first year or they have not been given the course yet or any other reasons, okay? But the one interesting one is the second one that says that, she said, I'm very experienced. Therefore, I see no need in taking the course. And uh, looking at the uh, demographic of this teacher in particular, uh, I understand why, because uh, she is really experienced, about to retire. So my, uh, the implication of my study is, if we have less trained teachers that do not uh, attend the CEFA CIC completely, uh, we are going to have problem because they are not properly trained. And having less qualified teachers who are not up to mark in the language proficiency would be also a problem. So how do we, how, what do I would, sorry, what would I recommend? I would recommend that we eliminate cascade training method because from the cascade training method, information might get diluted or, you know, um, misunderstood, misinterpreted or misrepresented. Um, I would recommend that the courses be done online synchronously and asynchronously so that the teachers will get uh, the uh, actual information from the national trainers themselves. If not the national trainers, then the uh, state trainers, if possible. And then when they pass the level, I would recommend that the government give incentive, just like what Uzbekistan did, to give incentive to the, the teachers um, as a monthly allowance per level and to make sure that the teachers are constantly updated. The teachers must attend biannual refresher course and to sit for a test if they want to keep the allowance. And to pass the test, sorry, they must pass the test. So for the less qualified teachers uh, here, if they um, take up the uh, proficiency test and get C1 or C2, um, the government should give them a one-off reward. The weak link here that I notice is that uh, teachers are asked to give grades that are not um, not how do you say um not really to the true students uh, level of uh, proficiency and the weak link here may bring repercussion to the nation's inspiration to elevate the standard of english um, it could actually jeopardize the nation's plan so to prevent this they could also have mentorship program uh, colleague supporting colleagues colleagues who are much um, who are much better in understanding the server could actually give, uh, you know, uh, personal uh, tutoring to or help to their colleagues, right? Great students based on their true levels. Pro, if the government insists that the teachers give justification, well, give the teachers a list, a checklist of preset justification. So it will make the work for the teachers much easier. So without all this, there might be unsuccessful implementation of our CEFA um, aligned curriculum. Arm the teachers with knowledge, okay? So to determine whether a teacher is of quality, a teacher must have knowledge. 
they must have skills, they must have abilities. So this is what we want from our teachers. So looking at our discussion here, uh, based on the discussion, the literature review here suggests that there is a good reference to gauge students' and teachers' level of achievement through the use of the several references. Um, and for the findings, um, it is seen here by the teachers that there are improvements in the students' language proficiency. And the teacher also said to, to uh, eliminate cascade training method because from what they have uh, experienced, by the time they attended the uh, in-house training, nothing much they could gain from that. And for the implication and recommendation, I've just explained just now. So to me, I believe that the chain is only as strong as its weakest link. So the teachers must be well trained. Let's look at the limitations here. Uh, for methodology, I only use one method. So for future research, I hope there will be mixed method used to gain a deeper understanding of the responses. Uh, surprisingly, more men teachers uh, answered my questionnaire. So hopefully in future, there will be more female than male teachers as my respondents, because that would be a more accurate representation of the teachers population in Malaysia. Uh, I did not ask the teachers for their um, origin of schools. Uh, so hopefully in the next uh, or in future researchers will be able to identify the origin so that we will know um, whether the states, uh, the origin of the teachers um, coincide with the similar uh, issues or the differential issues of these teachers uh, and whether they are from urban or rural, that would make a difference also. The cohort for my research was rather small with only 89 members, uh, 89 respondents. So hopefully we can get more than that from the uh, whole of Malaysia. My conclusion here, ladies and gentlemen, is that uh, this several aligned English language curriculum is still in its infancy stage. However, perception of the teachers are positive, is positive, and they see a potential in elevating the student standard of English. Uh, teaching issues and challenges like the proficiency, their proficiency and the skills can be, um, can be addressed easily. And hopefully the cascade method will be eliminated and the government should not put pressure to for the teachers to give grades not befitting the students level okay so this brings us to the end of my presentation thank you for your kind attention ladies and gentlemen have I come out from my <laughs> Yes, yes, okay. you're out. Okay. okay. <laughs> All right, uh, I'll take a question from the uh, online platform here. It comes from uh, Miss uh, Ruth. Uh, she said, um, is CIFA always accurate when assessing examination? For example, can we align SPM to CIFA? What's your take on this? I think it is possible if IELTS and uh, if IELTS can be done, uh, why not? If, if uh, move can be done online, why not SPM? Uh, the the I I I feel that the government will basically spend on the to uh, train our local examiners at that level. Okay. okay. All right, thank you for that. Um, to the audience, uh, any question that you want to ask? Miss Day? Okay, all right. Um, I, I have a few few questions here, Miss Day. Um, okay. Don't worry, don't worry, relax, relax. <laughs> I'm just a student, Dr. Paul. I'm just a student, okay? I know, I know. <laughs> I'm asking a student question, okay? <laughs> Don't give me a lecture question. <laughs> okay, um, I'm, I'm just curious. I'm not teaching English. The English is not my cup okay. of tea. Okay, so right. I hope 
makes you a bit more comfortable. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, my, my curiosity is, yes. you yes. said um, there has been studies on um, teachers in the, secondar uh, in the secondary schools, but there was not uh, yes. any yes. studies on primary school teachers. Is that oh, correct? It's just that I couldn't find any literature uh, based on specifically uh, on issues that the teachers are facing. Uh, they talk about the teachers' perception. They talk about the one and year two. Uh, how were they faring? Uh, what was the teachers' take on teaching the year one and year two? Um, they talked uh, about the uh, understanding of, of effort. But specifically, what are the teachers facing right now? Like for example, like I said, they had pressure from the government. Uh, this is not named government. It's not them. They up the management to award uh, or to grade the student uh, degree. Now I was a teacher before, and I was experienced uh, pressure too. If the students did not achieve. Uh, 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 oral test, we were supposed to write a report. Why? So in the end, as you know, public school teachers are really bogged down with a lot of work. So what do they do? They take the shortcut and just say, okay, never mind, everybody has a three. But that is not a very good reflection on our students' uh, uh, proficiency. That is what we want. If the students are no good, the government should do something about it. Have remedial classes, have remedial classes, train the teachers to be expert in that field. Okay. I, I'm rather passionate about it. Okay. <laughs> I, I, can see that. <laughs> I can see that. Um, so I, I guess you are in the process of writing up your thesis, right? In the, at this stage of time, you have the data, you have the findings, everything. Okay. Um, yes. I think one of the one of the points that uh, you might want to address. Okay, you don't have to answer. Okay, just a thought here. You might want okay. to address is um, at the very beginning you, men you you mentioned about teachers' resistance. Yes. Okay. You mentioned about teachers' resistance, and you mentioned about training, because uh, if the teachers have enough training, they will be they will have the confidence. They are more receptive. They are more willing. To, to to go to, to use this uh, CFF aligned uh, English uh, language teaching. So I think one of the issues that you have to address is how would you should think um, the training has changed their perception, their resistance, because you mentioned about teachers' resistance. So this is, I think, something that you need to address. You found something, yeah, but at the very beginning, you mentioned about teachers' resistance because human resistance, humans can be very stubborn, you know. Even though you send me for training, if my mindset is no, it's not going to be effective. Uh, so this is the area that you need to address because you did mention in your findings that if teachers go for training, they are going for training, then they are more effective in their teaching. So I think this is uh, something that you, you need to address in your writing, uh, in your discussion. Okay. In fact, I think yeah. that this is one of the topics that could be no research. Yeah. It can be research, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Evaluation of training effectiveness. Yes. Uh, that, right. that is my passion. That's my yes, passion. <laughs> okay. I think that the last thing that the, the last thing that um, you might want to consider is um, what is the theoretical framework of your study? Is there a theory that actually frame your study? Ha, that is the one that uh, I did not look into. Uh, Dr. Ida also asked me about that during my oral defense, but that was last week, so I'm so sorry. I, I cannot. I cannot. It's okay. It's okay. That's just for you to think about here. Um, are, are we looking at? Are we looking at uh, behavioral changes? Ah, so a lot of theories in this area, so you can take some of these theories and then apply into your study so that there is an underpinning theory supporting oh, okay, your discussion. Okay. It's not about I found this, but is there a theory that underpins your discussion and that will make your finding and discussion strong? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That, that's 
Thank oh, you so much. Me. Thank you. For, that's all for me, Mister. Thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you. Thank wow. you. Let's give Mister a big clap. <laughs> All right, so oh, you, you got fans here, huh? Good, huh? <laughs> okay, all right. All right, thank you. Okay, the next person we have Miss Ellie Li Tian. I think Miss Ellie is here. Hi. Hi, hi, Ellie. Hi. Uh, so the topic that Miss Ellie is going to present is teachers, teachers' engagement with multiliteracy pedagogy in English teaching in Malaysian higher education institutions. Okay, so yeah. you can share your topic now, Miss Ellie. Okay, I'll also turn off my video while I do the presentation so that the line is more stable. <laughs> Okay, are you seeing my screen? Yes, yes. Okay, I'll just start. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for attending my session today. I'm Ellie, and I'm currently just beginning my second year of PhD on the research title Teacher Engagement with Multiliteracies Pedagogy in English Teaching in Malaysian Higher Education Institutions. As I'm currently just in the beginning of my second year of candidature, my presentation today will focus on the background and context of my study, as well as how the study is significant in this particular context. I will also share a bit about what current literature has informed us on the topic area, as well as the research questions I've set out to explore. Now, first, to give a bit of background on my topic, Three key forces or aspects shape our changing world of communication today, as well as form the background of this study. And they are technology and literacy, globalization and diversity, and 21st century work and skills. Let's begin by looking at the first aspect, which is technology and literacy. It is a cliche to say that technology has changed the world we live in today, but indeed it is true. New technologies have altered the way we live, work, and communicate. We can see that meaning making is now multi-model with linguistic, visual, audio, gestural, and spatial modes now being essential components of people's uh, daily communicative practices. Traditionally, being literate means being able to read and write so that we can get educated and find a job. But as digital technologies and devices made it easier for us to access different information and content, the way that we receive and exchange messages are also different. And for teachers and students, technology has also brought new dimensions to education. So there is now a pressing need to re-evaluate the kind of skills necessary in future workplaces and economies. The second aspect of change when we consider today's world of communication is globalization and diversity. Modern communication is characterized by increasing global connectedness and diversity in different cultural, social, or professional contexts. So the norm now is not only to interact with just words, but words combined with visual images and sounds and gestures or movements. And all of this to be done with a large and diverse audience in terms of their culture, language, background, values, where they're from or where they're currently living in. As an example, consider what it means to recommend food these days. Traditionally, that would mean just telling your friends and family whatever thoughts you have in mind. Now, the simple communicative practice to recommend your favorite food means finding the best picture or taking the best picture to make your point, editing it to perfection, adding the best caption, all while keeping in mind the kind of responses you may now get from a much larger audience. And as our daily communicative practices change, the way students learn, communicate and perceive messages are also evolving. So it is not enough to focus only on a single standard version of English. Our students need to be able to negotiate meaning in different contexts. In other words, 
they need to be not just literate, but multi-literate in that they need to be able to make sense of what it means to communicate using new technologies and keeping in mind the kind of diversity in meaning making. The third aspect of what constitutes the changing world today is 21st century work and skills. Because of changes in technology and literacy and globalization and diversity in education, and in particular, higher education, it can be seen that uh, the type of skills required are also changing. So for instance, whereas in the past, the focus of getting educated is what to know, this pretty much right now, it pretty much goes hand in hand with what to do to know. So skills like critical thinking, creative problem solving, collaboration and teamwork and multiliteracies are now considered crucial components of a multi-skilled and well-rounded workforce. In 1996, a group of visionary scholars and researchers known as the New London Group saw the need for literacy and language teaching to be broadened. So they introduced the multi-literacies pedagogy, which looks at the processing of multiple modes of information and the plurality in literacy, where different contexts, texts and user identities bring about different literacies. Within this framework, the New London Group introduced a meta-language of design, which suggests that when we communicate, we're actually taking available designs, which are existing resources used for communication. We take that and then go through a process known as designing, which will enable us to transform the available designs into the redesigned, uh, which are new meanings that carry our values and ideas. The redesigned are never simple reproductions of the available designs that we received and understood, but they will become new available designs for other people accessing them. The New London Group also introduced the modes of meaning, which includes the written, oral, audio, visual, spatial, tactile, and gestural modes. So the essence of multiliteracies pedagogy is also the recognition that meaning making occurs not only through words or the linguistic mode, but also through many other modes of meaning. And as technology advances, in many ways, we've regained the capacity to make meaning and communicate using modes other than the linguistic mode. And as for the how we teach multiliteracies part or the pedagogy part, the New London Group first introduced the four-part pedagogy in 1996, as you can see on the left of this table. And then the framework was reconceptualized into the eight knowledge processes by Cope and Catlensis, two members of the New London Group in 2009. And because of time concerns, I won't be going uh, too, into too much detail on the pedagogy. But fundamentally, the components listed here are not sequential stages but stages that teachers move to and fro, or they weave to and fro, depending on their needs and the students' needs. So what does existing literature tell us about multiliteracies? So, so far, the widely accepted general opinion is that it enhances learner engagement, where the positive impacts include promoting self-directed learning, critical literacy, self-expression, creativity and cognitive playfulness for students. In fact, many of these benefits were seen as key skills in 21st century learning and work. On the other hand, teacher engagement with multiliteracies pedagogy is multidimensional or rather complex. Not only do contextual factors such as assessment related issues and institutional support affect how teachers engage with multiliteracies, internal teacher factors, such as their beliefs, perceptions, and readiness to use technology also comes into play. And even under the same set of contextual factors, it doesn't follow that uh, teachers respond to new pedagogical approaches in the same manner. And this is why we need to examine the factors and complexities that are shaping how they engage with multiliteracies in different uh, educational, cultural, and social contexts how their engagement differs, uh, what may be some of the underlying factors shaping these differences and how we can provide better support to teachers. In Malaysia, despite the many fluctuations in our language policy throughout the years, 
English has consistently remained an important subject in our education system. This is because of its role as the global language of communication and the government's vision for an education system that responds to both the development and labour needs of the country. So it can be said that Malaysian higher education students' English literacy is closely linked to the country's economic development. And consequently, English literacy pedagogy must adapt and respond to changes in communication. So looking at previous studies on multiliteracies in Malaysia, uh, most empirical research focused on student engagement. They found that uh, multiliteracies improve student commitment and interest in learning, encourage their creativity and enrich their overall learning experience. Um, the studies also highlighted some disjunctions. For example, how some Malaysian students found uh, collaborative work, critical analysis, and the concept of plagiarism quite hard to understand. But in extended studies, the researchers have also observed improvements in these areas. So besides students, some researchers also looked at parents and caregivers, and they found that parents and caregivers generally held on to more traditional views of literacy as only reading and writing abilities, and they are not sure about how they can contribute to developing their children's literacy skills. Although these studies are important in highlighting how it looks like or how it can look like to implement multiliteracies in Malaysia, there is a gap on how teachers are perceiving and responding to multiliteracies. And this is critical because teachers have the unenviable position of being custodians of traditional cultural practices, yet being expected to embrace progress in order to prepare students for the 21st century. So it is clear that further investigation is needed on how teachers enact multiliteracies pedagogy in Malaysian higher education, as well as the potential challenges and contextual factors shaping their practices. So the purpose of my research is to investigate Malaysian higher education English teachers' engagement with multiliteracies pedagogy. And specifically, it addresses three research questions. What are Malaysian higher education English teachers' perceptions of the changing views of literacy and multiliteracies pedagogy? To what extent do they enact it in their teaching and what factors shaped their engagement with multiliteracies? And to answer these questions, I will use a mixed methods uh, study consisting of two strands. Phase one aims to collect quantitative data on Malaysian higher education teachers or lecturers teaching English or academic literacy modules. And phase two aims to collect qualitative data to provide more in-depth findings on how teachers are engaging with multiliteracies pedagogy. And to finish my presentation today, I'd like to highlight that uh, teachers play a vital role in actualizing new teaching practices and pedagogical approaches. As what um, Dr. Jonathan Newton has emphasized in yesterday morning's plenary speech, what teachers do in class is very much transformed and affected by their own beliefs and perceptions. Therefore, investigations on teachers' perspectives are necessary. So this study seeks to explore how Malaysian higher education English teachers view changing literacy practices and the extent to which they have incorporated these changes into their teaching. And in doing so, it aims to identify possible areas for improvement and inform future teaching practices to produce multiliterate Malaysian university graduates. And that's all from me today. And once again, thank you so much for dropping by my session. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Ellie, for the wonderful um, sharing. Uh, from those who are here, any questions for, for Ellie? Open to the floor. Any questions? Okay, no question. Uh, online side, okay, we don't have questions. Uh, I have three questions, three only. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, first thing is teacher engagement. You mentioned that um, study has been done on a student's perception, parents and caregiver. 
but um, you did mention that um, no studies was done on the uh, teacher's perspective. Is that correct? Yeah. So my, so my question is, why do we concern about teacher's engagement? What is the problems? I mean, you, you, you may you may not be able to answer this question. It's okay. Just, just sharing my thoughts here. Why is teacher engagement so important? Is there a problem now? Because if you look at the studies, students are doing well, they are receptive, they are learning well. So why do we cast doubt on teachers' engagement? Okay. 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 You, you, you Thank you for the question. Yes. So teacher engagement has not been explicitly studied within the context of Malaysia. When teachers' perspectives are brought up, it is always asking the teachers, so how are the students doing in your class? How are the students receiving it? It's never about, so how are you finding it? Is it difficult to implement? Is it practical? You know, is it feasible or not within our setting? So that part is missing from our context. In other contexts, researchers have looked at teachers. And it's intriguing because uh, sometimes, as, as I've mentioned in my, in my presentation, sometimes even among the same set of contextual factors, teachers can respond very differently. So an example will be, let's say in Singapore, which is almost like a similar context as Malaysia, where a lot of the policies are usually top down. So even in a setting where the policy comes from top down, like in Singapore, multiliteracy is part of the English language syllabus, the way teachers react and respond is very different. And so that affects how they implement it, whether or not they use it, whether or not they are still adhering to methods or literacy teaching methods that are from, uh, I, I don't like to use this, but maybe from the past century or the traditional, more conventional ways. So that's why it's also important to study how it pans out in our context, how our teachers are responding to it in order to see where we lie and how much more we have to do in order to broaden our literacy pedagogy. Okay, thank you. All those things that you have mentioned, uh, do you have them written down? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> those, those are important to justify that particular point. Why teacher engagement? And the second point is, um, why, why higher education institutions? Mm. Mm. So the starting point, so higher education institutions is typically the last milestone for most of our Malaysian uh, graduates or Malaysian workers before they enter the workforce. And since, since I think this COVID-19 pandemic is a very timely reminder that communication or the way people work or the kind of skills that we should be instilling in higher education institutions have to change. How things have been done have to slowly evolve and change. So that's why this is the last milestone. And since it is very much linked to how the, the development of the country progresses as a whole, so that's why I chose to look at higher education institutions. And secondly, this is also where the gap lies. In Malaysia, wherever they implement multiliteracy pedagogy, it is usually done in secondary school setting or primary school setting. They implement it as like a, almost like an action, action research uh, basis. So that's usually done in those two contexts, but we don't see how that pans out in higher education, even though this is a very important uh, step before they enter the workforce. Okay, thank you for, for the answer. Um, the last one probably is a, a general one is, what is the expected problem that you try to uh, solve? In this case, because I can't really see the, the big problem here. You mentioned that teachers' engagement is important and so on and so forth. But um, I think in, in your writing, especially in your problem statement, um, the obvious problem needs to stand up clearly that, hey, we have a problem. Teacher engagement in higher education, um, uh, teaching using multi-literacy pedagogy is a problem. That will be very uh, good foundation. Otherwise, uh, you've mentioned about the importance of teachers' engagement, and you mentioned about uh, some of the past studies in primary and secondary. Th those are problems, but 
putting all together is not significant enough to justify a study. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, so you have to think of how to, how to collect all this and create that punch. This is a problem, okay? Teachers engagement of uh, uh, multi-literacy pedagogy, English teaching in higher education is a problem. And you break it down into all these small, small problems. And that would be very okay. obvious. The people are convinced that, yeah, you, you are doing the right thing. So go and find out and tell us more. Oh, thank you so much for the tip, writing everything down. <laughs> most, most welcome, <laughs> most welcome. Uh, let me check, any question? Okay, I think, yeah. Okay, based on what I've asked, um, ladies and gentlemen, guys, uh, any other question you want to add on? <laughs> okay, I think, uh, yeah, I think that that's all from us here. Okay, thank you so much, Ellie, for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, next we have Miss Lila. Lila came in quite early to test out the line and, and she asked me, is this uh, B005? Yes, Miss Lila, you are in B005. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah you, can, you, can share the, you, you can share your screen with the video off, it's fine. Yeah, you can. And yeah, um, Miss Lila's uh, topic is about SOFH flow maps helps in improving the achievement of law achievers of six SS2 in communicative Malay literature, uh, literature subject. Yeah, over to you, uh, Ms. Leila. Thank you to the moderator. Good afternoon to distinguished judges and all conference participants. I'm Lila Anna Intai from SMK Tun Abdul Raza. You can reach me at lilaintai at gmail.com. The topic of my action research is soft flow map helps in improving the achievement of low achievers of six science social two students in communicative literature subject. I have been teaching Form 6 Communicative Malay Literature subject for 12 years at SMK Tun Abdul Razak. I find it difficult for students to present and elaborate literary facts. This study is conducted because of my awareness to try and find solutions to the problems encountered in the teaching and learning of Class 6 Science Social 2. The majority of these 6 Science Social 2 students have a more level of achievement in SPM, which is at least a C in Malay language. Most of them are from B40 families and are day students living in nearby villages. The focus of the study is the issue of students not being able to present and elaborate literary facts based on the given question. This issue is the cause of the decline in students' achievement in communicative Malay literature subjects. Problem statement. Number one, students are unable to present literary facts based on the given question. Number two, students are unable to elaborate literary facts based on the given question. Based on my initial observation, I find it true that students do not know how to know the requirements of the question. This results in them not being able to present the correct literary facts. They also do not know how to elaborate the literary facts based on the requirement of the question. This causes them to not be able to answer the questions correctly. Teaching and learning process in the classroom has been using one-way communication method and lecture mode, which cause lack of response and interest from students. The purpose of this study was to solve the problem of Form 6 Science Social 2 students who could not present and elaborate literary facts based on the given question. A study from South Korea by Kim and Park 2016 used sketching techniques along with my maps to improve A previous study by Muhammad Siddiq and Ahmad, 2012, on 290 students at Gold Pasir Putih Secondary School 
clearly proves the effectiveness of the use of I think mind maps that can show changes in students' behavior towards a more positive and diligent attitude. 34 students are to achieve at least grade C in and in students' response and interest in the classroom during teaching and learning process. Specific objective. Students are able to answer essay questions correctly using soft flow map. Research questions. Number one, are students able to present accurate literary facts using soft flow map? Number two, are students able to elaborate literary facts using soft flow map? I'm using Lewin model 1946 as my action research model. Starts with reflecting, replanning, acting, and observing. This is my intervention, which is a soft flow map. It has three levels where scope of question is the first thing that the students will have to think where they need to think of the contents within the scope of the question. Then they need to understand the action words before they can elaborate the literary facts based on the action words. This is an example of an STPM question. Nationalism is an important foundation in the development of a country. Explain the statement based on the novel Saragabasa Dari Kuala Lumpur by Chris Mas. Now we are using soft flow map to elaborate the action words. The question is nationalism, which is the content of the question. And then Students need to understand the content. They need to explain the action word. And the action word is clearly explained. And students need to elaborate examples. So the question limit here is based on the novel, Sauda Gabaksar Dari Kuala Lumpur by Karis Mas. The uniqueness of soft flow map, number one, this software map is easy to use during teaching and learning process. And when the exam is conducted, as students only need to draw three flow squares. Number two, soft flow map continue to be their guide to elaborate the correct facts. Number three, students can easily remember events, characters, and other aspects of literature in the literary text study. My target group is six science social two students who will be sitting for semester three STPM examination in April 2021. A number of 34 six science social two students comprised of seven males and 27 females. The students, all 34 of them comprised of all low achieving students in the mid semester three examination. These are the activities conducted during the problem in week three and executing course of action and collecting data and observation. Then we went on to collecting data and analyzing data in week four of June 2021. And during that time, there's an announcement of STPM results, which is on 28th of June, 2021. Then um, the report on the excellent research was written on the first week of July, 2021. And in 19th of July, the study has been presented. Document analysis, student daily exercises and assignments. 
According to Ibn Hajar, a research instrument is a measuring tool used to obtain qualitative information about variables that have character and objectives. Data collection through document analysis can provide information relevant to the treatments used in resolving the issues encountered. Here is the result of trial examination. It can clearly be seen that based on this result, we can see it has demonstrated the effectiveness of soft flow map. The document content analysis technique was chosen because it is a systematic approach to analyze data and information in accordance with qualitative research. Then we are going to compare the two examination set, which was the mid-semester three examination and semester three trial examination. Now, as we can see here, there's a 0% of full pass in mid-semester three examination. And when we compare it with semester three trial examination, the percentage of full pass was 51.43%, whereas partial pass was 28.57%. So we can see an increase of percentage in the number of students who obtain full pass. Observations during teaching and learning. On 29 of March, 2021, in Six Science Social 2 classroom at 7 to 8.30 a.m., students continue to refer to their respective notebooks after writing the question statement. They seem to focus on finding relevant facts based on a given soft flow map. For Cresswell 2009, document content analysis is one of the specific techniques for qualitative research. Here we can see the number of students' response, basically um, from do not understand to totally understand. 81% of the students totally understand what has been discussed during the lesson, and this Data has been collected via Google Form. Now we can see the smallest number of percentage, which is 5%, are students who do not understand the lesson. Okay, soft treatment on week one, February 2021, which was on Monday, 7 to 8 30 a.m and Tuesday, 8.30 a.m. to 9.30 a.m. Students draw a soft map on a piece of paper. Students will be given two sets of questions based on the literary text studied. Students mark or outline the aspects of literature, which is the content required by the question. Students will be asked to identify aspects of each of the questions given to them. They will complete the soft flow map in the space provided then students write definitions or concepts of the aspects required by the question. Here is how the soft flow map help to elaborate action words. Here's the question. They need to write the content of the question. Once they understand the content, they need to look at the action word and then elaborate examples. So they have to make sure they know the question limit about the kind of writing they are referring to. Soft treatment on week 2, February 2021, Wednesday, 9.45 a.m. to 11.15 a.m. and Thursday, 7 a.m. to 8.30 a.m. Students underline the action words found in the question on how to write the answers according to the action words that are often used in STPM examination questions. Students will be asked to note down how they write their essay based on the action words given in the question. In week three, students will outline the question limit consisting of the characters and words, which is the genre of writing stated in the question. Students will record the characters and events found in the work mentioned in the question and relate the characters and event in the work 
to the literary aspects requested. In week four, students will be given reinforcement exercises to complete in the classroom within 45 minutes. Students will be asked to use blank paper to draw a soft flow map and list the aspects, action words, and question limit in five minutes. Students will then write notes or steps they need to make in the content paragraph according to the action word. Finally, students will list the character traits in the work as required by the question. Here's my findings. Can students present literary facts correctly using a soft flow map? Students seem to focus on finding relevant facts based on a given soft flow map. When the activity started, I found they were able to write correct descriptions of facts and examples. They use different colored pens to mark fact sentences, descriptive sentences and examples in each paragraph. Overall, they continued to complete the assigned task within a stipulated time period. Format continues to be their guide to elaborate correct facts. So can literary facts using a soft flow map? Yes, they do. So here's the reflection of actual STPM semester three examination results. I'm focusing on STPM 2019 and STPM 2020 results. There is a significant increase of 0.63% in the results, which shows the result has improved from the previous year. Now we are looking at the school average grade. So it has increased from 2.12 in semester two 2019 to 2.35 in semester two STPM 2020 with a significant increase of 0.83% in the subject average grade and school average grade of STPM 2019 semester two examination with STPM 2020 semester two examination. Now we look at the percentage of passes in STPM 2019 and STPM 2020. In 2019, there were 75% passing rate. But in 2020, it has increased to 94.12%. Now for mid-semester three examination, we can see that the full pass has increased to 51.43% in semester three trial examination. In conclusion, I can reflect that students' response has improved. Many students produce high level answers. Classroom atmosphere improves and students become more active in answering questions. The constraints in conducting this action study. However, I found that six students still have not mastered the subject, not even after using SoFlow map. They showed lack of interest in their studies and are not actively involved in teaching and learning process in class. Recommendations for improvement of action research. I plan to continue to conduct action research on this group of Form 6 Science Social 2 and 6 Science Social 4 students 2021 session by refining some aspects in the previous action research. Thank you very much for your questions. For the presentation. Okay, um, based on what Ms. Linda has presented, any question from any of you here? All right, um, no question. Yeah. Oh, sorry, your question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can ask uh, questions. Lila. 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 Right, so uh, I'm Joffrey, and can you hear me? 
Sorry, can you yes. Yeah. Okay, so I'm just curious because uh, you know it's it's good that uh, there is an improvement in the students' uh, performance. It seems in the SPM, I think was it 2020 compared to the previous year. But I'm just curious, um, how do you determine if that is actually the result of using this particular, like the introduction of this floor track? Uh, could it be due to other possible factors uh, that could potentially affect the students' performance? Thanks, Jocelyn. Uh, Ms. Lula, do you get uh, Jocelyn's uh, question? I think her, her question is, how do you know it is because of SIF flow map and not something else that caused the improvement in the SPM results? Connection issue, maybe? Ms. Leela, are you still here with us? Ms. Lila, are you able to respond to that question? Your mic is on. Mic is on. Yeah, your mic is on. Can you hear us? Or do you need to change device? Okay, I think she logged out and tried to log in again. No. Miss Lam, maybe you can try to log out and come in again. See whether it helps or not. You try to log out and then uh, log in again. If you can hear us. But then the status off. Yeah. <laughs> the other presenters are yeah, can hear us all right, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, all right. Okay. Um, I think due to circumstances, uh, we'll, we'll come back to Miss Lila again. Yeah. Uh, um, after the next presenter. Okay, Ms. Lila, if you are able to, please um, stay here with us. Uh, hopefully, the line will get better and we will have uh, some Q&A um, after the last presenter. Okay, thank you. Now, the next presenter is Ms. Nurafifa Binti Ismail. I think uh, Ms. Nurafifa is here. 
Uh, can you turn on the video and say hi to everyone, uh, Ms. Norafifa? Hey, uh, hang on. Is she here? Our line is okay. Is Ms. Norafifa here? Contact. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Hey, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we seem to have a bit of a technical issue uh, with Miss Leila, and uh, we're still waiting for Miss uh, Norafifa to come in. We'll try to get in touch with uh, both of them. So let's give them some time to uh, reconnect it with us. Technical glitch. We're trying to contact uh, Miss Lila and uh, maybe Miss Nurafika.
No, 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 and so, uh, so she's trying to get online right now. Oh, okay. okay. So I told her I'll give you 10 minutes. Mm. Uh, so if you can come online, we'll present. If not, we'll just have to do a presentation. Okay, so 10 minutes. Yeah, 10 minutes. So we'll say 3.40. Okay. Okay. Trying to connect with Lila. Mm. Lila, we're trying to connect with Lila. Uh, yeah, I tried to call her, but the uh, connection is just cut off. Mm. But she's online. So weird that she's... She's online. She's online. Oh, it's so nice. Mm. Mm. And she's not responding to the... Yeah, maybe just informally. Okay, so, so sorry, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let's give uh, Ms. Nora Fifa another 10 more minutes that uh, she will come in and present her topic this afternoon. Her topic this afternoon is Permainan Kakono, Meningkatkan Penguasaan Novel Sejamba Bakti Melalui Pendekatan Fun Learning. So this should be very fun, fun learning. So uh, let's give her a bit of time for her to log in. And at um, the same time, I think uh, is Miss uh, Lila still here with us?
So, okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it seems that um, Ms. Lila is uh, not able to continue uh, the conversation here. And Ms. Nurafifa is not with us. So, thank you so much. I think for this session, we will, we will end here. Thank you for coming and uh, thank you for those who have presented Miss uh, Mr. 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 Sorry, Mr. and Miss Ellie for your presentation. Okay, we can always uh, stay connected and um, now with the internet, I think uh, we, we can get to know people's uh, contact easily. So uh, looking forward to connect with all of you. Uh, all the best in your study, in your, in your thesis writing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye.